So tonight we're going to begin a new series, and uh, we're going to look for the next seven weeks in the book of Revelation, of the, the letters to the seven churches. So, new series. And uh, I'm going to read just now our passage. So tonight, obviously, we're studying the first letter to the first church, which is the church in Ephesus. But what I want to do is to lead into that reading. You've got the reading in your handouts, the uh, Revelation 2, first seven verses. But I'm actually going to read from Revelation 1 into that reading. So you can pick up the reading on your sheets. And the reason I want to do that is because I want to just say uh, briefly a few things just to kind of set the picture about these letters, just to give a little bit of context and a little bit of background to what we're going to be thinking about. Revelation is a book that in many ways a lot of people feel quite daunted by. Understandably, it's a book that we need to give a good amount of attention to, but it's a book ultimately about Jesus, the victor, uh, Christ Jesus, the king, and the, the victory that has been won by him. And just to say a few things about the letters specifically, first is to say that uh, I can't really read these letters, these individual letters to these individual churches, without first taking note of the verses that I'm going to read in chapter 1 from verse 9, because they help us see that these letters are from Jesus to his church. And that's really important. So this book, we believe, was written by John. But they're not just letters from John to the church because he felt like it. These are, this is writing, obviously, inspired by the Holy Spirit. But these are letters from the risen and the glorified Christ. And we get this wonderful description of him that I'm going to read in just a minute. So that's the first thing. Secondly, just to say that these letters deal with maybe this is obvious, they deal with real-life churches in time and space. So we're talking about places that exist, existed, churches that existed, that had real issues, and the letters are written to address those issues. Third thing to note is, if you were to read through, if you were to take a bit of time tonight and go home and say, well, I'm just going to read through, it wouldn't take you very long, I'm going to read through these seven letters over chapters two and three, you may notice that there are patterns that occur. So the way they're written is roughly the same in each letter. You could say that the same kind of things occur, like each one starts with a description of Christ. A very vivid picture, but a picture of Christ nonetheless. They most always then have a commendation. So they say to the church, this is good this thing that, we, that uh, we want to describe, this is good, before they go on to describe something that is a problem. And uh, so then we have a rebuke often, sometimes a very sharp rebuke to the church. Remember, we're dealing with real churches with real situations. So we have this commendation and a rebuke, and often then there's a solution. So in the face of this rebuke that they're given, what should they do? They're given this solution And the letters often finish with a promise. So to those who overcome, for example, here is the promise that they will receive. And you'll you'll see something of this pattern, if you like, when we come to the the letter to Ephesus. But the final thing I want to point out, just before we read this passage, having taken notice of the fact that these are real letters to real churches in time and history, they yet apply to you and me today. Each one concludes with, uh, or certainly the one that we're reading today, and many of them conclude with the note that the Spirit is speaking to the church. Now that was relevant to the church who received the letters, and it's relevant to you and me also. So by the Holy Spirit speaking to us through his word, God still speaks to us today. So therefore we can learn from these letters, which is, which is good for us. So I haven't just said those kind of There's lots more you could say about the letters. There's lots of historical information. There's lots more about the way they're structured, all kinds of things. But I just wanted to point out a few of these things now. But I really want you to to really note, as I'm going to start reading from uh, chapter 1, verse 9, the the incredibly dramatic, powerful picture of Jesus. Let me read from Revelation 1, verse 9. 
I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the lampstands one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash round his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And now to pick up on the reading that you will have in your sheets as we move into chapter 2 and to the letter to the church in Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you've not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet you have, yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Amen. We ask that God will bless his word to us. So, Revelation chapter 2, the church in Ephesus. We often sing Psalm 23, and we know as we sing it, the Lord is my shepherd. But what does that mean? The Lord Jesus is my shepherd. How so? How is he our shepherd? I need to think, as I I mentioned when we were just taking a brief look at the outline of these letters, that startling, powerful vision of Jesus. I want you to think of these letters as coming from the great shepherd, the great pastor of the flock, Jesus, to shepherd and pastor his flock. Remember, even just last week, we were looking at Pentecost, the impact of Pentecost, the fact that Jesus, risen again and glorified, sent his spirit to the church to indwell every believer and so to lead them into all truth and to show them the way that they should go. Now, that means me and you, to show us the way that we should go. Jesus did not leave his church when he ascended to the right hand of the Father. Jesus sent the Spirit, and Jesus still knows and cares for and pastors his people who he bought with his blood because of his great love. So these letters are from the great shepherd of the sheep 
to the flock who so often need pastoring. In many ways, we're foolish, aren't we, if we think we don't need pastored from that great shepherd, Jesus. Yes, we believe. We believed those years ago. But we need to go on believing and receiving help and guidance and the loving care of our shepherd, Jesus, every day. Now, this, just to emphasize that, is the pastoral work of the great shepherd king. Now, remember the context. These Christians are facing a whole load of trouble from, if you like, the king of the day, the kings of the day, the Caesars. The Roman oppression is gathering momentum and believers are having a hard time. And how do they deal with that life that they have to live in the face of that great oppression? All kinds of different troubles come their way. And all kinds of troubles emerge in this church and in every church, if we're honest, down through the ages. And into that context comes this letter written by John, but from this great shepherd, Jesus. So I have three points tonight. I uh, enjoyed Corey's confession this morning of his alliteration because it's my confession also. He and I had exactly the same experience this week. I don't usually think like that maybe but three p's came to mind and i couldn't help it so i have three p's Corey had three m's i want us to think of this letter in terms of jesus's presence jesus's priorities for his people and finally jesus's promises to this church that he's writing to so the first thing is simply to stick with this theme that i think we've already sort of started along which is that jesus the great shepherd communicates vitally to his people to say, I am with you, listen to my voice. See the words that he uses at the start of this uh, chapter. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now, You remember from the reading of the end of chapter 1 there, we've already had the explanation by Jesus himself of this imagery. Now, you'll maybe be familiar with the fact that Revelation is full of imagery, sometimes very complicated imagery, but imagery that can be worked at and understood. But the imagery that we're faced with uh, immediately in this chapter, see verse 20 of chapter 1. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands... Well, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Some people would say literally angels. Some would say the leaders of the churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So these visions, these pictures that are being used, are simply to describe physical realities. People. The lampstands represent seven churches which are being written to. Of Ephesus being the first one. So there we have uh, the start of chapter 2 then. Look at the way Jesus describes himself and what he does. The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, upholding them, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, who walks among the churches. See, Jesus didn't ascend to heaven and forget about the church. And Jesus didn't ascend to heaven and occasionally send out envoys to sort of see what's going on. How are they doing? Send news from Scotland. How is my church doing? Because I really don't know. This is the shepherd who walks among his churches. Now, we know that he does that by his spirit now. But the connection between Jesus and his church is vital. Look at verse 2. Jesus goes on. I mentioned that the, the, the body, if you like, of the letters expresses commendation. So praise, if you like, for an aspect of their church life. And also rebuke. He goes on to detail things about them that are good and bad. But obviously, that is because he knows them. And he says that at the start of verse 2. I know your works. Now again, he doesn't know about their works because he occasionally receives updates. He knows their works because he's with them. Now, how does that sound to a church facing oppression? That sounds beautiful. That sounds encouraging. 
uplifting. You know, we're not alone. We're not doing this all by ourselves. We've not been told how to get on with our lives and then just left to it. Jesus is with his church. So Jesus' presence is really just the first thing I just want to highlight to you there. Because that applies to this church and it applies to us now. Jesus' power isn't diminished. Jesus' interest in you isn't diminished by time because this is 2,000 years later. Jesus' interest in his church is as vital now as it was then. Because from the beginning of his work in drawing a people to himself, until the day that Jesus comes again, he is building his church. He is drawing a people to himself. And every one of those people down through every age is known by this great shepherd king and loved equally and he holds all in the palm of his hand i walk among the seven golden lampstands i know your works i know you though you may not feel it right now let me tell you i know you so jesus is intimately interested in this church jesus is intimately interested in our church so he's intimately interested in you Our business, if you like, as a church, is his concern. And don't think about that just like in terms of, oh, well, we have an AGM. He's interested in the accounts. And I'm not trying to trivialize that at all. Every aspect of his church, of your spiritual well-being, of how you're going on in the faith, is his concern. So Jesus' presence with his people is the first thing to highlight but then what that does is it enables the church to know that he knows how they're getting on for good and for bad so when we move into the body of the letter if you like into the the middle chunk of the letter there we get as i said these points of commendation and concern or critique things that are going badly with them that they really need to deal with And that's the second point, because this is Jesus' priorities for his people. So he doesn't just come and say, hello. He comes very particularly to say, this that you are doing, this is in accordance with my will. But this that you are doing is not. And you need to stop this. You need to put a stop to this. First thing, uh, the commendation that he brings to them. Uh, We see this in verse 2. We also see it in verse 6. He he wants to commend them because he says, I know you, I know that you hold to the truth. So, see that in verse 2. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. But then he goes on to describe this. How you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. Okay, So they've got no time for people who are evil. But then look again at verse 6. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So Jesus recognizes in them that their distaste for that which is untruthful, ungodly, and evil is in accordance with the way he feels about evil also. And he commends them. He says, this about you is good. He wants to encourage them with this. The church is to discern untruth. We need to be very careful about that. Are we able to be aware of false teaching? Here's the thing. We sometimes think very immediately in that case of pressure that would come to us from outside the church. Uh, Worldviews that are in discord with what we believe. That's maybe the most obvious way that we think about that. That was true for this church. They faced a lot of uh, cultural, social pressures on their beliefs. Ephesus, after all, held one of the seven wonders of the world, the great temple of Diana or Artemis, a pagan temple, huge uh, discord with the Christian message. So there was pressure on them, all right. And we presumably feel that pressure also, don't we? The pressure not to believe, the pressure to just conform and probably the pressure we feel is to water down what we believe just to stop being so edgy and at odds with what you know everybody just getting along with each other and believing the same thing more or less but actually what's interesting about what is brought to their attention here 
is that the danger they've all there they faced, obviously, as is described particularly in verse two, is pressure from within. So uh, you have tested those who call themselves apostles but who are not. So in other words, people who are coming and saying we are going to be leaders and teachers in this church, but their teaching is at enmity with the truth of the gospel that Jesus wants his people to uphold and to cling to. There are many reminders in God's word of the importance of this, aren't there? Of not being led away, of not being distracted. Paul writes of this also, Colossians chapter 2, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition and not according to Christ. So that's really important. What that boils down to, at a personal level for you and me, I suppose, is do you know what you believe and why? Because if you know what you believe and why, and of course, that is a developing thing, isn't it? We go on knowing and understanding who God is and what it is that we believe. But at a basic level, do you know and understand the gospel, what it is that you believe, so that you can give an account of what you believe, so that you're able to articulate what you believe when somebody comes expressing something that is false? Now, we maybe think, oh, well, there are no threats from inside the free church. Our teaching is sound and solid. Just hold on to that fact that we are to be those who know the truth of Jesus and hold on to that. So that when somebody challenges your belief at work or when somebody comes into church and expresses something contrary to the gospel, we are able to explain. We're not haranguing them. We don't throw them back out the door. We don't despise them, but we hold to the truth. Jesus wants his church to know and to hold to him as the truth. So that point is made very strongly. Jesus commends them for this. I know this. I know that you're persevering in the truth and in the gospel. That sits uneasily, I think, with our culture. Talking again just for a minute about outside pressures on us. Look at the language that he uses again. We go down to that. Uh, verse 6 that we read regarding the Nicolaitans. Now, the Nicolaitans, there's dispute about exactly who they are. Uh, a sect, basically, that could have been a Gnostic sect that, that brought in teaching uh, uh, that wasn't in accord with the gospel, let's say. They were a, it was a threatening teaching to the gospel. And they are cast out, if you like, by this church. Their teaching is exposed as being false. But look at the language that's used. Look at how strongly it's spoken of. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Tolerance is a huge thing today, isn't it? I think what that means, what people want tolerance to be, is to be able to say, everybody's right, kind of. Everybody's kind of just the same. So that, you know, the only thing that's really spoken of as being wrong is when you say to somebody, no, you're wrong. And so ultimate truth is the thing maybe most under threat. But here, what we read of and hear of is a kind of righteous hatred of false teaching. Is it the case that when you hear somebody blaspheming Jesus, when you hear somebody teaching against Jesus, when you hear somebody, maybe even from within a church, leading people astray by teaching a gospel that is no gospel, it bothers you. Or do we become kind of blasé about that? That's a challenge, isn't it? Challenge to me. Maybe a challenge to you. Do we love the truth because the truth is Christ so much that when we hear that which is false, we recognize it as evil because it leads people astray from the true Christ, the true Savior, the one who is the way to life. So false teaching isn't just something we disagree with. It pains our soul to hear it. Jesus says, you hate the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Okay, so they're commended for holding to the truth and rejecting falsehood. They're also commended briefly because they endure. They're keeping going. Jesus is able to say to his church, you're still here. You know, we're preaching on Ephesians at the moment, in the mornings. 
Well, here we are reading this letter to the church in Ephesus. A few years later, they're still there. They're still going. They're still holding services. They're still preaching the gospel. They're still identifying false teaching. They're still going. So they're enduring. They're able to mark out heresy. They are seeking to be faithful. But here's the problem. And this will lead us on to our next point. The problem is if all they're doing is enduring. You know, I was remembering uh, an incident in my Sunday school career when I was young. When I was young, we were taught the catechism. And uh, I think I must have been being tested on the catechism, which I probably found no fun. But maybe it did me some good. And I was asked the first catechism. Now, if you know the first catechism, the answer is, what is man's chief end? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So my 10-year-old self managed to say, to glorify God and endure him forever. So I was corrected, which is a good thing. But isn't that interesting? I think sometimes that can actually be what it feels like to be the church. We're just enduring. To be the church is to endure, to just get by, to put up with it. To know God is to endure him. We don't like a lot of what happens in our lives. We don't like a lot of his providences. We don't understand him. We endure him. Is that the case for you tonight? Because that leads us on, as I was saying, to the complaint that Jesus wants to bring to his church. The commendation is that they're persevering, that they're identifying truth, that they're enduring, but it seems like enduring is all they're doing. And that, in fact, the joy and the love that should have been so evident amongst them wasn't there. Verse 4. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Now, he doesn't go on and develop that. He doesn't explain it. doesn't take a lot of time to say it. He says it in one very short, devastating verse. You have abandoned the love that you had. Look at the word he uses, abandoned. That's strong language spoken of, spoken by the great shepherd, pastor, king to his people. You've abandoned the first love you had. It may well be the case that these people were excellent heresy hunters. They could spot false teaching 100 yards off. But they were being poor brothers and sisters to one another. That they had very little spark of love towards their great saviour, Jesus. They were cold. And the danger for them was a cold orthodoxy, where they, they ticked the right boxes in their understanding and their teaching, and they're worming out of all the wrong teaching, but they were cold. People speak of a dead orthodoxy sometimes. I don't want to say they, this church had a dead orthodoxy. They're not spoken of as being dead here. They're still the church of God. And Jesus comes to his church and speaks to them, to pastor them, but to warm them because they've gone cold. Because their love isn't there. Because that hugely vital aspect of who they are as individuals and as a, as a body, it's not there. It's missing. And uh, so this is, the, this is the big challenge that they are to face. And he calls them back to that love. Look what he says at the start of verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. See, that's the way he deals with it. He challenges them. Your love has gone cold. Remember. Now, isn't, isn't that a very, a very gentle, but a very good way of dealing with this problem? What is it that we need when we know a cold heart towards God? We need to remember. We need to be reminded again of what it is that our Savior has done for us. We need to be called back individually or as a people to say, you know, you're not just doing this because it's a, a kind of handy Sunday night routine. You're not just doing this because you like being at odds and having a bit of argument with everybody at your workplace and you like to stand out from the crowd. That's not much fun. Remember the love that Christ had for you. Remember that. And repent. 
That's the other call that Jesus has to his people here. Remember the love that you had. Repent. It is a grievous thing that you have grown cold. Again, there's a bit of disagreement about exactly the, the, the object of this love. Is this speaking about love between each other? Or is this speaking primarily about love between them and God? I think in many cases both are true. Both could well be true. Because isn't it the case that one comes from the other? How is it that we're able to love one another well? Because to be honest, that's often quite difficult, isn't it? Uh, To genuinely love one another, not just a fuzzy feeling, but going out of your way to serve, going out of your way to love your neighbor, even when your neighbor is difficult or gives you problems. How do we do that? Well, it's because we were first loved. Because we, first of all, understood the great grace of God in dealing with us before we were lovely. We didn't deserve his love, and yet he loved us and lavished that love on us at the cross. And so we love one another. So remember that. That's the, that's the key to being able to have our hearts warmed again. You know, sometimes we think, I need to love God more. I've got to work at it. Well, there's a, there's a way in which that's true. But remember... Because, you know, you'll never be able to work up, a, if you like, a good enough love. You'll never kind of... If you do that, if you, if you wind yourself up into, a, into a, a love for God, then you'll maybe find that come next week you'll just feel the same again. Remember. Because your salvation is based on the love that he had for you. So Jesus says, remember. Jesus says, Repent. And uh, he says repent because their situation is serious, but it's not irretrievable. So they're not lost. They're just struggling. They're just cold. They're ticking the right boxes, but their hearts are far from God. So Jesus' presence is with his people. He knows his people. He knows the good. He knows maybe the well-intentionedness of his church. But he knows and is able to speak right into the core of the heart problem that they have collectively. That the love that they had has grown cold. And the third thing I want to just point out as we move towards the end of this letter is the promises that Jesus gives. There are two promises that he gives to his church. The first challenge follows on from what I was just talking about. The problem that the people had in their cold heartedness, the lack of love that they had. And it's a, I think it's a really startling promise that he makes to this church. Because look at what he says in verse 5, the second half of verse 5. <laughs> Repent, do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. In other words, you will be no more. I will remove your lampstand. I will remove you as a church. There will be serious consequences for you if you don't heed my words. Now, you might think, well, that's harsh language. He wants them to remember again the love that they had for him. And in order to do that, he wants them to remember the love he has for them. But then he says, if they don't do it, he'll remove their lampstand. And he speaks in such cutting language to them. How can he do that? But it's really important to remember the seriousness of love as a marker of the Christian church. I'm going to turn just for a minute to John's first epistle, so the letter of John. Because if you read particularly 1 John, love is all over the place. What it means for God to love his people and how his people then in turn love one another. There's lots of references. Be good for you to go home tonight and read that. So let me just turn to 1 John chapter 3. See what John says in this letter about love. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. We know that we've passed. If you like, it's a marker of it's it's not how we get saved it's not how we come into the kingdom but if you like it's a marker it's an evidence we've we've passed from from darkness to light from death to life and so we love one another because 
All of our relationship, all of who we are together as a collective church is based on the fact that Jesus somehow, out of his great grace, loved us. So we love one another. And uh, in verse 23 also, John says, And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Isn't that very clear? And isn't that very challenging? We believe in Jesus Christ. That's how we get saved. And then we love one another. You know, Jesus was asked, about priorities priorities, and he says love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself out of out of the outworking of God's grace in our hearts we love one another and so you know if there's no love in our community then we ask questions we have to we're challenged to ask questions and we're challenged to think then Well, what does it mean to love one another? Because it's more than just a fuzzy feeling, isn't it? It's not just, you know this, it's not just feeling towards somebody because that comes and goes and it depends on the person and it depends on the personality and all kinds of things like that. But to love one another, remember the great expression of the Good Samaritan who saw somebody in such great need and he went out of his way to care for that person. He expressed, he applied love. We think carefully about what it means. But the point being, the the central place that love for one another has as a marker of those of us who are Christians who confess Jesus Christ as Lord. So, this great challenge is to this church. Remember, refocus on the love that you had because of the love that you have received. Or the, the consequence that is given there. Now, that's difficult, isn't it? But we have to remember, you and I, that the discipleship that we have, the ongoing walk as a Christian, being a, being a believer in Jesus Christ, is based on gratitude. We have been so loved that we love. It's based on submission and humility. Remember that great passage? in uh, Philippians 2, where it speaks of having, having the same love as Jesus Christ, who came from heaven in all glory and all majesty and humbled himself to be the great one who served. You know, this in, in, in many different human institutions, if you like, there's so often discord and a lack of love because what prevails so often in the human heart is self-interest. You know, we think we know the right things to do. We think we know what should be happening. We have personality clashes with all kinds of different people and so there's discord and strife and a lack of love but we are asked to submit to one another out of reverence for christ and we're asked to have the same mind as christ and uh, we're asked to consider others better than ourselves we have to that takes some thinking through doesn't it how do i do that how do i consider my neighbor who i sit next to in the pew as better than myself even if i think i'm cleverer than them even if i think i do a better job than them even if i think whatever so love for brother and sister as a marker of the church very important we love because god first loved us remember so that's the first promise but then we get a second promise and it's a promise of we see there in verse seven he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches to the one who conquers i will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of god now jesus had to speak and he will we'll see this as we go through the letters sometimes in in uncompromising terms jesus had to speak with clarity and uh, precision about a problem in their fellowship but we finish the letter with this this hugely pastoral loving promise to people who may be very beleaguered again remember the pressure that they have remember the environment in which they live and witness and he says to them remember again Remember the promise that you have always had, that I've always given you, that if you prevail, that if you persevere, if you endure with love, 
then uh, the great words here i will grant to you to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of god these are the words of the great shepherd these are the words of the one who knows his people who knows that they go wayward but who knows that they need to hear his voice directing them and protecting them from going waywardly and shepherding them back to see his loving promises to them and to remember that for them is this great future with him this time when again they will know the presence of god in the renewed heavens and the renewed earth i will grant to eat of the tree of life and uh, we read of that later in revelation i'm going to finish by reading that these few verses but that's a promise that still rings true for you and me as well tonight so sometimes we need to be challenged don't we our hearts grow cold and uh, we become selfish and we need to be called out of that and called again to see the grace and the love of jesus but we also need sometimes the 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 care and the love of a shepherd reminding us i have great hope for you so hold on i have a great future for you so hold on and uh, what that looks like we read of in verse in revelation chapter 22 we get a great reversal if you like of the curse what did adam and eve do what did the first adam do in the garden he ate of the tree that brought the curse what does jesus say to his church here i will grant that you will eat of another tree of that tree that was forbidden that was banished if you're banished from in, in, in back in genesis the tree of life but that promise of life everlasting life is yours again and i will grant that you will eat of that and what that looks like in revelation chapter 22 just hear these words as the outworking of the promise of jesus to his people then the angel showed me the river of the water of life bright as crystal flowing from the throne of god and of the lamb through the middle of the street of the city also on either side of the river the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations no longer will there be anything accursed but the throne of god and of the lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more they will need no light of lamp or sun for the lord god will be their light and they will reign forever and ever such is the promise of jesus to his church and such are the words that we can take to heart tonight and believe on as those who are followers of jesus let me pray lord we ask that you would allow us to uh, that you would help us to allow you to shepherd us help us not to put up any blocks help us not to close our ears help us to be honest and to ask you in prayer to honestly uh, if you like divide up our hearts to see the problems that we have to identify them so that we can repent and so that we can draw near to you and help us we pray to be reminded of your great promise to us this great picture of the place where you will dwell with your people and and we will know peace and we will know joy until that time lord jesus when you come again help us to endure but help us to enjoy endure with joy and gladness rejoicing as your spirit is at work amongst us and help us to love one another help us to think carefully what that looks like and help us to remember that we love because you first loved us we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.